You ever live through an earthquake? Any of you ever lived through an earthquake? Well, I guess you have if you lived in Philly, because we've had California. Oh, yes, California. Yes. Um, guys, I'm an earthquake survivor. Uh, <laughs> we all are, actually, I think, because we've had earthquakes in Philly. When I was in high school, my hometown had an earthquake. Uh, this is in western Pennsylvania, and I didn't even notice. I was walking home from school. I got home. People were like, did you feel that? And I was like, feel what? I did not feel that earthquake, and I remember a couple years ago, we had something like three very minor earthquakes in Philadelphia in a short period of time, and I, was, I remember one of them, I was sitting on the porch next door to the church, and someone ran out of the church like, there was an earthquake, and I was like, where? In the church? Because I'm right next door, and I didn't feel it. And they were like, oh, the, sh- the lights were shaking and everything, so I've probably existed through four or five earthquakes. I've never felt any of them. I don't know if I have like really good balance maybe or something, but I've never felt an earthquake. What are you supposed to do when you go through an earthquake? Yeah, cover. You, you want to get like maybe under a door frame or underneath something. You want to be in one of the safer parts of your house, right? You want, don't want to just be in the... You would not want to be in here with things attached to the ceiling. Uh, you'd want to get somewhere safe, maybe underneath something. Uh, would you grab on anything if you could? If you could grab onto a wall or a door frame, you might do that. What's probably gonna, what damage probably is going to be suffered if, if your house suffers an, earth, an earthquake? Yeah, it could be a structure, foundation, maybe your pictures fall off the wall, stuff on the counter goes down, right? I mean, those things are frustrating, but not the end of the world if those things happen, right? So, you know, earthquake happens when tectonic shakes, uh, tectonic shifts move and uh, tectonic plates shift, sorry, sixth grade geology. Uh, we, but we experience things in our life that are kind of like earthquakes. COVID was kind of like an earthquake for people. Like it shook, it shook us up, right? And when those things happen, certain things come crashing down. So the book of Amos, which is what we're going to look at today, we're almost going to like survey the whole book of Amos, but we're going to focus on the end of Amos. In the book of Amos, Amos is this prophet. He's not a professional prophet. He's actually a, like a, a sheep herder. Um, in the book of Amos, he prophesies an earthquake but it's a literal earthquake. We're not talking a metaphorical earthquake. We're saying like this earthquake actually happened in 760 BC, okay? A real earthquake, not a, oh boy, it was a rough week, I had an earthquake. No, this is a real earthquake, the earth shook, okay? Now, this has been, archaeologists have uncovered uh, references to this earthquake. They found broken buildings, you know, like this, this really happened. We're going to start in Amos chapter 1. We're just going to read four verses today, so don't get overwhelmed. I know I said we're going to do a whole book, but we're just going to read four verses today. Amos chapter 1 will be on the screen. This is the beginning of the book of Amos. The words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa, which he envisioned in visions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Okay, so that helps us, that's important for us, because everything we're about to read, he said this before the earthquake. How long before the earthquake? Two years before the earthquake, okay? Understand that. Like, he wasn't talk, looking back at an earthquake, he was saying, Here's what God's going to do. He might not have even known there was going to be an earthquake. He's just sharing, here's what God's going to do in your life. And it, God used the, a literal earthquake to accomplish these things. So let me read verse 2. Amos says, The Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he utters his voice, and the shepherds' pasture grounds mourn, and the summit of Carmel dries up. Now, he's starting to use poetic imagery to describe a historical reality. The historical reality is there's an earthquake, but what does he describe it as? The Lord roars, right? Like a lion roaring, sending vibrating sound waves through your chest, right? He says the pasture ground 
mourns, like the ground is heaving, it's lamenting, it's moving, the pasture ground. So he's beginning to say, something's going to shake. And like I said, this is two years before the earthquake, this earthquake takes place. Now I'm going to summarize chapter one and half of chapter two, but Amos starts his book by confronting all of Israel's local enemies. He says, for instance, to the people in Damascus, which is in Syria, he confronts them for their sin, and he says, uh, God is going to send fire on your city walls, and he's going to consume your fortresses. And, and all the Jewish people are like, yeah, get them, God. And then Amos moves on to Israel's other enemy, Tyre. And he moves on to Ammon. And he moves on to six different pagan enemy nations that were near them. And God says the same thing to all six of them. I'm going to burn down your walls and destroy your fortresses. And, and you can, it's not in the passage, but you would assume that the, the Jewish people are like, that's right, that's Yahweh, he's going to get you. Yeah, he's going to burn your walls down. Like, this, this is not going to be good for you. Sounds great, right? God's going to destroy your enemies. God takes that same approach, and then he turns it, in chapter 2, he turns it toward his own people. The clapping stops all of a sudden. Because in chapter 2, he says, Judah, Judah, which is the southern kingdom of Israel, I'm going to judge your sin. And then to Israel, which is the northern kingdom, I'm going to judge your sin. All of a sudden, no one's clapping and cheering. They're like, us too? One of the problems that God's people experience in the Bible and maybe still experience is they thought that because God chose them, he was going to give them a free pass. But the reality is God's like, no, because I chose you, I expect more. You know, we, we, this is how it manifests in our life now. Oh, Jesus loves me and forgives me, so I'm going to do whatever I want, and I'll just ask him to forgive me later. No, the, I think the biblical reality is he expects more from you than a person who he describes as blind. You aren't blind. So there, therefore, the expectations on us are higher. So he says to these six places, I'm going to tear down your walls. Sounds like an earthquake, right? I'm going to destroy your fortresses. Sounds like an earthquake, right? What's he going to do to his own people? Now we have to go all the way to Amos chapter 9. Go to Amos 9. I'm just going to read one verse. Before I read it, let me explain what it's talking about. When, uh, when my wife and I were newly married, I would bring her home a gift almost every day. I would bring her home chocolates, flowers, uh, football jerseys, uh, the, you know, double X football jerseys. <laughs> I would bring her home a gift every day because I like to give gifts. I also like to receive gifts. So I'm a gift giver type of guy, but my wife is not. She likes to spend time with people. So this was annoying to her because I was always 30 minutes late from work coming home because I had to get a gift. And it took us a while to figure out why she didn't like the gifts and why I was angry that she didn't like the gifts. But we finally worked it out. She's like, rather than you taking 30 minutes to get a gift, I'd rather you just come home earlier and spend the time with me. Okay. So what I learned, what I learned there is you want to love people on their terms, uh, as long as you're not violating a scriptural principle. There's a, there are some limitations there, but as long as we're within the realm of scripture, you want to love people the way that they receive love. My wife was saying, I like time. So I could either be really selfish and say, well, sorry, I'm getting you gifts. I could do that. I could establish a whole pattern and rhythm for Doing it my way, not what you've told me to do. So Israel, God's people did that in the Bible. They had this temple in Jerusalem. You're probably familiar with the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, Solomon built it. Jesus confronted it. Uh, we polluted it. But because the temple in Jerusalem was so far away for some of them, they, built, they started building other temples. 
They built one, and if you lived in the north, they built one in a town called Dan. Dan, beautiful name. They built one in a town called Dan. And you know, and since they only had one Ark of the Covenant, you know what they put in it? A golden bull, <laughs> a statue of a golden calf. And then if you lived in the middle, they built another one in a town called Bethel. Bethel, what a wonderful name, right? That means house of God. They built a temple there, and you know what they put inside that? Another golden statue of a calf or a bull. And then if you lived in the south, you had the one in Jerusalem, which was the original, the one that God filled with a cloud of glory, okay? So the one in Jerusalem was the original. The ones in Dan and Bethel were bootleg ripoffs that were full of idols, That temple at Bethel is what we're talking about in Amos 9, verse 1, and let me read it. The Lord, I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and he said, smite the capitals so that the thresholds will shake and break them on the heads of them all. Remember, we're talking about an earthquake. Amos 9, 1 is telling us how the earthquake is going to destroy this man-made temple, idolatrous temple in Bethel, He's saying from the top to the bottom, this, the capitals, that's not the capital city. He's saying like from the top of the pillars, they're going to crumble. The thresholds are going to shake and it's going to fall down on all of your heads. This man-made, idolatrous, non-sanctioned, unblessed temple you built without my permission, that baby is coming down on top of you. That's the, that's the result of the earthquake that Amos is foreshadowing and preparing them for. Does that make sense? So here's what we've had so far. Amos 1 through 9 is just God saying to, the, to your pagan enemies, I'm going to destroy their walls. I'm going to destroy their fortresses. It's all coming down. And to you, my people, I'm bringing down your false worship I'm tearing down your idolatry. I'm shaking it all down. It's all going to be rubble. I mean, this sounds like a devastating, disastrous earthquake. And everything that, that is identified as coming down, it all represents false worship. In fact, right smack in the middle of Amos, chapters 4 and 5, Amos really confronts false worship when he says, you guys sing these songs and you make these offerings but you don't treat people fairly. And I really wish you would stop singing those songs and start treating people fairly. You know, you you bring these offerings, but then you also charge high rent on the poor and high taxes. So how about stop with the songs and still you start treating people equally? So the whole book is just confronting, like, I don't like the way you worship me. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring it all crashing down. That's, the first nine chapters of Amos. That'd be heavy to hear, right? It's a little heavy to hear even now. So that takes us to the end of the book of Amos. This is really the point that we're getting at today. Amos chapter 9, verses 11, 12. Remember, he's tearing it all down. He's bringing all the false worship down. And then he says this, in that day, the day where I bring all that fake worship crashing to the ground, in that day, I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its branches. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. So in the day that he destroys the temple in Bethel, the fortresses in Damascus and Tyre and Ammon, in the day that he's bringing those all down, he says, but in that same day, I'm going to build something. I'm going to rebuild something he calls the booth of David. Or another way you could say this would be the tent. A booth to them was a tent, or you might have heard a big word, tabernacle, but just think tent. It's a tent, okay? God is saying, in the midst of tearing down all of your stuff, I'm going to rebuild my thing. I'm rebuilding this tent of David. Now, you might be asking, I should probably know what that is. <laughs> but what is the tent of David? Like, what are you talking about? 
That's what we're going to spend the rest of our time on. And we're going to go through, uh, I'm not going to re- uh, read all these passages because it would be overwhelming, but it's in uh, 2 Samuel chapters 6 and 7, as well as about the middle third of First Chronicles tells us about David's tent. So can I just call it David's tent? You guys got that? It's the same thing as the booth of David. Just I'm going to call it tent because I don't know about you. I don't really call tents booths anymore. I call tents tents. David was one of the kings of Israel. I think he was the second king of Israel. He loved God's presence. Remember, what was he before he was a king? You remember what he did? He was a shepherd, you know, and there's a lot of uh, downtime when you're a shepherd. And so David, we find, was a worshiper. He was singing songs to God, and he actually was pretty good on the instruments. Uh, I just say the instruments vaguely because I don't play any instruments. So to me, they're all the same. But he was pretty, a pretty good uh, musician, and he would sing songs to God when he wasn't um, killing bears and lions. Very, a very like a Bruce Springsteen vibe to David here. And so he, w- he was a good musician. He became the king. He loved worship. One of his first duties as the king was to get the Ark of the Covenant. He wanted to bring it back into Jerusalem. If you remember the Ark of the Covenant from Indiana Jones and also the Bible, the Ark of the Covenant was this box covered in gold. It was about six feet long by three feet wide, covered in gold. Remember, what would happen if you touched it? You die, right? Because here's why you die. The understanding was that box was God's throne. In fact, the top of the, the lid was called the mercy seat because God was believed to sit, to manifest himself, to localize himself on top of this box. Does anyone remember what was in the box, the Ark of the Covenant? We've covered this many, many years ago. There are three things. Aaron's staff, I heard that. The Ten Commandments. And a jar of manna. So it was almost, in a way, it was like a time capsule. You know, we got all these things from our history, the Ten Commandments, a jar of manna, uh, Aaron's staff representing the law, God's provision, God's authority are in there. David's like, I want that back. And they get it back from the Philistines. There's a whole long story, but he brings it back into the city. He's so excited to have it back in the city. You might remember the story. He starts dancing. Yeah. Remember, what, ha- what's he, what happens when he's dancing? His clothes come off. He's so wild, right? His wife looks out the window, sees her husband dancing basically in his drawers outside in the streets. She gets really salty about it and gives him a hard time. And uh, it's just, uh, I mean, why isn't this a movie? (laughs) So he brings the ark in, and it says in 2 Samuel in 1 Chronicles, he puts the ark in a tent that he had already pitched. Like he knew this day was coming. He's had this tent ready and he finally gets the ark. So that tent, five things that happened in that tent. First, that tent was a place for God to dwell. When he put the ark in the tent, that tent became dedicated to the hosting the presence of God. You know, the ark represented God's presence. If you went to the ark, you were gonna speak to God. That tent was not a waiting room. It was not an office space. It was not a family dwelling. It existed for one purpose, to host or to hold God's presence. It had that purpose and that purpose alone. It didn't, they didn't let it get distracted by anything else. David's tent was a home for the Ark of the Covenant. It was a place for hosting the manifest presence of God. That actually is one of our strategies as a church for how to sustain revival is we have to value God's presence. When God is active among us, we have to stop everything and and go with that. When God is convicting us of sin, we need to stop and be convicted of our sin. When God is encouraging us, when God is revealing things to us, when God is leading us in a certain direction, we need to value that and not take it for granted because sometimes we do take it for granted and then we wonder why God hasn't spoken to us recently because we've taken his presence for granted. It's one of the scariest things that followers of God have done for thousands of years is taken for granted his presence. 
So that's the first place, that, uh, the first thing that the, the tent is, it's a place for God to dwell. It's also, this is to me one of the more exciting, one of the most exciting parts, it's a place of continuous worship. So this tent must have been a pretty good size. I don't know exactly how big it is off the top of my head, but I know this. In uh, 1 Chronicles 16, as well as 1 Chronicles 23, it, it outlines the staff that David hired to work at this tent. And it was, get this, 4,000 musicians and 288 skillful singers. They're described as skillful. He gets these people, and it is their job. These are priests and Levites. It is their full-time job. This is not a hobby. It is their full-time job to worship and to lead worship in this tent 24-7, perpetually, continuously. Now, if you have about 4,300 people going for you, you could probably pull that off. It's actually in 1 Corinthians 20, uh, sorry, 1 Chronicles 25, he divides those 4,288 people. They're divided into family groups. So there's Asaph and his sons and Jeduthun and his sons. And there's a guy named He-Man. It's probably pronounced Heman, but I call him He-Man. It's spelled the same. I have the power. <laughs> so there's these groups. They're based on families. There are, get this, 24 groups. If you had to organize nonstop worship and you put it in 24 groups, what might that indicate? Everybody does an hour, right? If, you, if, if we can just, now it doesn't say in the Bible that they actually took one hour shifts. That's not in there. But it's implied or you could at least imagine how, well, if we have 24 teams in 24 hours, that way we're not burning everyone out. Everybody comes, spends an hour, and then they go about life. They have life to live. They have families to take care of. They have food they have to prepare. They have you know, stuff to do. So I want to point this out. This continuous worship thing was not one person's job or two people's jobs. The whole community participated. It took thousands of people to pull this off to do 168 hours a week of nonstop worship. This is not something that one person could sustain alone. Now, for us as a church, we're, we're trying to lean into that. We're a long way away from 24-7, but one of the things we've been focusing on is at least becoming a seven-day-a-week church where we have a discipleship group or a service or something every single day of the week because that is in the New Testament that they met day by day. So... You know, we're not 24-7, but you would start with seven. We at least gather every single day in some way, whether it's in a service or a small Bible study or a prayer meeting or something like that. If we can establish that, we can grow from there. I don't know that we'll ever get to 24-7. John Eric's in charge of that. But, you know, what we want, though, is to continually and perpetually host God's presence. It doesn't even need to be in this room, by the way. That, you know, it doesn't even need to be our church alone, by the way. There's a ministry here in Philly called the Philadelphia Tabernacle of David. Their goal is to get something like 24-7, but they're, they're trying like to get like 50 churches to do it because isn't that way easier? Yes. So uh, this is perpetual. A third thing that took place in the tent is a place of offering and sacrifices. They would bring burnt offerings or they'd bring offerings that they would burn to the Lord. So it could be grain and plants, or it could be animals. So it, it smelled like burnt leaves or a barbecue, depending on what the offering was. That means that when you are coming near, you're, begin, you're entering into like the atmosphere of the tent even before you get there. You're smelling it. I mean, I, this is not hard to imagine, but the tent could be 100 yards away, but you're hearing the music. You're smelling the smells. You're beginning to, as you get closer, you're, you're already entering in before you ever open the tent flap, right? So this is a place of sacrifice. The reason that this is important for us, I think, is because it, it seems like people are starting to forget that when you come near to God, you're supposed to bring him something. We, we're turning into consumers. Gimme, gimme, gimme. 
You give me something. They came with something in their hands and left empty-handed. We come empty-handed and expect to take something back. That's consumerism. As if God is like a business and he has to market to us. And, oh, God, that was a good marketing campaign with that COVID thing. He doesn't market to us. We're not customers. You understand? Uh, when we're, when we're operating like they did in the tent of David, we're bringing him something. We're coming to please him. We're coming to uh, offer to him, sacrifice to him. It's going to cost us. Something that we had, we're not going to have anymore. It's, we're going to lose an asset. We're going to lose some money. It's gonna, we're not going to make the most that we could bank because God's worth it. Does this make sense? Okay. We're not going to live our best life, maybe. Because, I mean, in reality we are, but it's not going to be measured by, like, comfort and material wealth and objects that we possess. It's going to be uh, measured by our nearness to God and our Christ-likeness. So it's a place of offering and sacrifice. Fourth, is a place for the word of the Lord to be declared. I had to do this at the first service, and I'm going to do it again now. I'm going to read you a verse that is so weird that if I didn't read it, you probably would think I'm making it up. So I'm, it's uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 1. It's not on the screen, but it's in your Bible. You would probably think I'm making this up if I didn't read it. I want you to listen to how they prophesy. David and the commanders of the army set apart for the service some of the sons of Asaph and of Heman and of Jeduthun, who were to prophesy with the lyres, harps, and cymbals. Now, here's what it's saying. They're going to prophesy with their instruments. That sounds a little strange. So this could go one of two ways. It either means that while they play their instruments, they're prophesying, but it could also mean they're prophesying through the instrument. Have you ever heard instrumental music that moved you. If you've ever heard uh, orchestral music or a symphony or classical music, Bach, Beethoven, all them dudes, you've heard, you'd have heard instruments that have provoked a response in you. I don't know exactly what's, which of those is intended by this passage. All I know is it's a form of musical prophecy. They're either singing it or playing it somehow. Do not underestimate the power of worship to make an impact in the spiritual realm. You might remember this story. King Saul was so oppressed by evil spirits that he would go almost mad. And the only time he could get relief was when he brought David in to play his stringed instrument. So that's an example of how David's ability to lead worship actually had a uh, spiritual warfare effect of making demons flee. Don't forget that next time you're going through something, okay? Also, that doesn't just mean hit play and let some YouTube video do the singing for you. You better sing too, okay? Got that? Don't let YouTube do your battles for you. That's a nice little help, but you need to sing too. I feel like you're getting this today. That's good. All right. It's a place where the word of the Lord is declared. For us, that means that our worship should be saturated with Scripture. We know this is the word of the Lord. This is reliable. We ought to be singing this stuff. Sing it. Repeat it. Pray it. Use Scripture in your worship. Declare it. John Eric does a great job with this. He did it today. Incorporating Scripture into the singing, even spontaneously, as you... Um, internalize God's word, you'll find, man, it just kind of pops out sometimes. Wasn't even expecting that. All of a sudden, a verse you didn't try to memorize, it's in there because you're internalizing it, which is different than memorizing it. Internalizing is like letting it get in your DNA and your, in your guts. But the word of the Lord was declared there, and then finally this. This tent was a place of creativity. First Chronicles 23, 5 says that David invented instruments to use in the tent. You know, they didn't have 
all these instruments that they needed. So David was like, you know, we need a, we need a xylophone. I'm going to invent a xylophone. I'm going to invent an oboe. Okay, he didn't actually invent the xylophone and the oboe, but it does say he invented instruments. He created instruments, and then he had to teach people how to play the instruments. What a, let me just say, what a weird king. <laughs> you know, it's like, I thought kings were like fighting wars and, you know, running, running stuff, and he's like inventing instruments and giving music lessons. But that's what he was about, and that's why God said he's the one after my heart. That's the man after my heart. So David invented instruments. That's creativity. Also, if you just open up anywhere in the book of Psalms and go one page to the left or one page to the right, you'll probably find a psalm that has a heading like, for the priests to sing in the ministry of the tent or uh, for the Levites to sing. So many of the Psalms, not all of them, but many of the Psalms are the result of this 24-7 worship service they had going on where people would sit or sing or do whatever they were doing, be in the tent and begin to write. And it's possible that in the Psalms when David prophesies the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus very well could have been written in that tent. Like God is showing people stuff. In that, that's the environment where many of the Psalms came out of. So not only are they inventing, is David inventing instruments, but like songs that have been sung for 3,000 years. You think hymns are old. Psalms are old. I mean, we're singing potentially, depending on this, what we read or sing, you could be singing or reading a psalm that was written in that tent. So that's creativity. Here's the other thing. This tent becomes the forerunner for the temple in Jerusalem that you're probably familiar with. Uh, David gets this tent going, and one of the prophets comes to him and says, hey, David, how come you live in a nice house, but you're making God live in a tent? Ouch. And David says, okay, we're going to build God a big old house. And God actually says, well, you aren't, but your son will, because you killed too many people, David. But yeah, that's right. So Solomon actually, his son is actually the one that builds it, but the tent was the forerunner to the temple. So a lot of the priests and the music and the sacrifice and the ark gets moved into the tent under Solomon. Sorry, gets moved into the temple under Solomon. God fills that temple with a cloud that's so thick that people can't even do their job. They really just end up on the ground. So... I say this because look what this tent produced. It, produ it produced instruments. It produced songs. It produced an entire system of worship known as the temple that resulted in the glory of God filling it. That's what Amos is saying. God wants to rebuild. He's bringing down all the fake stuff so he can rebuild that. And I will go a little bit further the apostles in Acts chapter 15 quote Amos 9 and they say, in the day that he returns, he will reestablish the, the booth or tent of David. So they, even they had an expectation like this is coming. Now, just to be very, very practical, uh, I'm not going to get caught up in whether it's a literal tent you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily looking for a literal tent to be reestablished on a hill in Jerusalem. I think at, at the very least we can safely say, but what was in the tent? It's not about the tent, it's about what was in the tent. It's the, the focus on God's presence. It's the creativity. It's the sacrifice. It's the type of worship that costs you. That's what God wants to rebuild. But he had to tear down all the fake stuff first so that he could rebuild this. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay, so we could just like uh, chill and wait for someone else to do that. And you're like, you know, when it comes, we'll take a trip to Israel and do all that. But I don't think that's what he wants. If you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, 
then what was in that tent can be in you. That tent was just a container made of skin. That's what you are. You're a container made of skin. The atmosphere that existed in David's tent can exist right in your chest. There can be the word of the Lord declared. There can be the hosting of God's presence. There can be creativity. There can be sacrifice. It can be continual. Don't wait for some building to get erected somewhere. Today that can start right here. So I want to ask what your worship times, your, your, your time with the Lord looks like, whether it is private or public like this morning. What does it look like? Does it look like it's centered around God's presence? Or is it just like, well, we're singing three songs, so I'll sing the three songs. <laughs> or, or are you actually responding to a God that you believe is in the room? Right? Or, or whether you're at home. And maybe this is before bed or in the morning or whenever you, in your car, wherever you have a chance to do this. Are you responding to another person who is there? Is it regular and consistent or is it rare and occasional? It was 24-7 for them. Now, they did that in a community. No one person can sustain 24-7. But is your, is your time with the Lord regular and consistent or is it rare and occasional? That's the goal, is regular and consistent. Do you present offerings to God that are a sacrifice, or are you a consumer? Gimme, gimme, gimme. Or, or do you bring something to God that costs you something? Say, Lord, this costs me something, but you're worth so much more. So, so I don't even count this as really a, a, an issue, because I'm giving you this, because you're worth it. Is God's word proclaimed during that time? Again, whether it's our, us corporately or you privately, are you proclaiming God's word? Are you proclaiming scripture out loud? Are you hearing from the Lord? Maybe him speak into specific situations in your life that you really need to hear, you need clarity on, you need him to speak. It, a lot of clarity can come out of times of hosting God's presence. And then this is the last one. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up because they're gonna help us kickstart this. Is it overflowing in creativity? Is your time with the Lord overflowing in creativity? Does it result in you journaling? That's creativity. I don't know that I'd throw that on Facebook necessarily, but it's, you're creating something. You're creating a history with God. Does it result in you painting something? Does it result in you writing a song? Does it result in you coming up with a solution, a creative solution to a problem? Is, it, is there an overflow? Or are you just like, ah, I read my Bible, closed the book, I've already forgotten what I did. It should, it doesn't have to be every day, but from time to time it should result in the creation of a prayer or a painting or an activity or it, there should be some overflow from this time with the Lord. Does that make sense? So, let me conclude with this. I'm not hung up on the tent aspect of this. It's not the tent that I think God's after. It's what was in the tent is what was happening in the tent happening in us? It should be happening in us. It should be happening in our church. It should be happening in the church. So I'm gonna pray for us. Pastor John, Eric, and the team are gonna lead us in worship because I, I want us to apply this immediately. So sacrificial worship, declaring the word of the Lord, valuing his presence, we can do that right now as we respond. Jesus, we bless you. You give us this model. The apostles seem to say that this is a model even for the New Testament church. That this is something we should look to, aspire to, and that as a, it's this that results in the nations flooding to you. It's the hosting of your presence, the declaring of your word, this offering of sacrifices. This is what makes people from across the globe respond to you. So, Lord, may we be a Tent of David type fellowship, a Tent of David type congregation that hosts your presence, and may we not let false worship exist among us. I pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.